Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, I need my tools. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you all for coming. You've been sitting for a long time, or am I wrong? And uh, it's quite hot in here, so, uh, so that's a good, uh, good start of everything. But what a fantastic place. Um, so I've been asked to talk about 40 minutes or so, uh, and it's about, I've chosen the topic that we have today, which is community. Um, I come from a company called Henning Larsen. We are based in Copenhagen in Denmark, and we believe in uh, discoveries and in curiosity, and these are some of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about some of how we work. I'm going to talk a bit about what we believe in, and I'm going to talk about uh, some of the projects that we've done. Um, but I would like to start here. This is uh, when I came to Sao Paulo uh, one and a half year ago or so. It was very early in the morning. It's around uh, half past five. Uh, it was raining heavily and suddenly it started to rain even more. And you could see on the faces of people and how they were walking, they started to kind of be uh, a bit uneasy. This is in Copenhagen one year earlier. Uh, we had our first 100-year uh, rain and it totally kind of flooded the whole city of Copenhagen, the whole inner city, in just a couple of hours. It was quite violent and it basically just kind of paralyzed a lot of things. So at Henning Larsen we talk about and we focus a lot about designing for people. We always done that, and we design in eye height. However, in the last couple of seven years or so, this one has been on our minds and has had the full attention from our six offices, which we can see also is a, 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 a possibility that we have as a company that we across borders across nations, since we have our six offices around the globe, we can be more aware of the challenges that we have for her. And some of these challenges is, for example, how do we act in a time of complex challenges? For us, one of the answers to that is collaboration. How we can work together how we can work with our clients, how we can work with uh, the people that are going to be part of our projects and be using them. Another thing could be uh, how will we manage waste? And one answer to that could be to create awareness how to reuse. How do we reuse old structures like this? How do we reuse old areas like we are in today? How do we deal with mobility in our cities? And we just saw some different kind of aspects of that and the consequence of, of uh, mobilities in cities. One of the ways that we could see and how we can challenge that is to create density in a good way. This is a product that we just won in Shenzhen and it's a huge new district. But what we have focused very much on is to create a promenade and public spaces that are basically in the heart, in the center of this concept, of this project. Will we have access to clean air? One answer to that is to deal with microclimate and to work with microclimate in different ways, both inside and outside. Will inequality continue to rise? One thing is to create awareness on community and how our buildings can kind of advocate community in different ways. So a question could be, will this be my future, your future? I hope not. And one answer to that is to actually embrace nature in all the things that we do. Because nature 
has this power which is hard to put words on. It makes you feel better, it makes you more healthy, and this is extremely important to carry f to our children so they can, in a city, also be very close to nature. It's a simple thing, but it's extremely important. As human scale, how we deal with human scale in different ways, and how that also is not only on the outside, but on the inside, extremely important to the projects that we do. And to create a sense of place where we are and where we kind of are working, we need to have a connection to the local community, to the local heritage, and to where we are. So where we are based is here. This is Copenhagen Harbor. It has a lot of similarities uh, as in Kiev with the harbor going through the city. And what is interesting is that we are actually biking everywhere. Uh, this is uh, during summer, of course. Uh, but also uh, during uh, winter, we bike all the time. Uh, so I think there is a lot of the, uh, the Scandinavian kind of uh, mentality is very much embedded in how we work. And I think Scandinavian mentality and Scandinavian design is very much about accessibility and equality. A harbor project uh, that we've been working on uh, for quite some time, the last year or so, is uh, the, it's, uh, the, the, the shipyard area in Gdansk Harbor. Uh, I didn't plan to take this project, but since I was on a boat trip that was quite interesting this morning, I just put a few of these slides uh, in here because I think it also raises a lot of kind of uh, things that we've been working here that you are uh, actually currently dealing with. So this is basically the harbor. This is our uh, vision for the harbor. Uh, and of course, it is a massive master plan that we're currently working with the municipality and the people there and the client and so on. And there is a long time span for this. Uh, and we are working very hard to kind of keep the old buildings. And there is a long time before you start. So. To be able to create an identity before construction, some of these sites, they will be kind of uh, uh, planted with, um, with sunflowers. It's also because the earth is extremely polluted, and this flower is very good at kind of cleaning the earth of that. Another thing which is extremely important for us in this project is to embrace the history and to see like, okay, so where can we kind of keep the buildings that are there, and at the same time create some uh, specified areas where people can meet. So it creates kind of a, a catalyst for different kind of public life around the plan. And in a sense, uh, this kind of ping pong with a large public plaza, a public route to the next one, and then basically to the next one, and then you have some smaller ones in between, and then you mix the old, wo old buildings with the new ones. And one way of that was the exactly building that we just saw is that we're also trying to see, okay, can we actually combine it with the old structure, with some new uh, typologies like housing and offices together? And this creates this kind of very versatile plan or program that we are currently working with. And I believe that this, in this direction, is something which is needed for a lot of harbor regeneration projects. So you have scale and you have program for a variety of uses and a variety of people. We are also a variety of people. This is our office in Copenhagen. I mentioned that we are seven offices. We are around 325 people dispersed out on these different offices. Um, and basically, uh, we were founded in 1959. And I think that what uh, kind of uh, drove us very much is that we've been very kind of curious all the time. We're curious about uh, technology. We are curious about kind of challenges. And we are moving towards, you know, the conflict or the challenge rather than away. 
Uh, we are design-driven practice with uh, kind of integrating studios within our company, focusing on so sustainability, interior design, landscape, and urban design. Um, we have this kind of uh, saying that we design with knowledge, we think before we draw, uh, and I will come into that a bit later. This is our sustainability department, they are sitting and working away, and they, the sustainability department are 20 engineers and PhDs, and they flank everything that we do, and they have a central kind of core around daylight, and then they're looking at comfort, energy, uh, economy, architecture, and health, in terms of different tools and different kind of components that they can kind of flank the designs that we do to make it more sustainable, more energy efficient. Because I think that somehow this is kind of a buzzword, the smart city or the smart building. And it is, in many ways, in a super interesting concept, right? But it's extremely unimportant until it's defined. What is it? How do we use it? Why is it called like that? It's just a cool world, word. So what we try to do is to kind of infuse it with knowledge and, and, and purpose. And this is some of the applied research that we do in our office, in our sustainability department. We look at microclimate, facade designs, shared space, uh, spaces, big data, daylight, materials, acoustic, and energy design. So you know this very well, I imagine. How many of you are architects? How many of you are developers? Any? Because otherwise I would say that maybe you can talk afterwards <laughs> about this slide. No. So this is sometimes how it looks, or usually uh, how it looks. Um, but however, uh, we learn it the hard way, and we have for quite some time moved away from uh, this type of creative process and we, our design process is basically uh, within three brackets. We acquire data, we explore and select, and we then produce and present. And what that means is that we, we look at the data that we have collected, we do an analysis of that, and then we do something that we call a strategic concept. And the strategic concept is something that we try to collaborate with our clients and our partners to find a common ground what is the most important thing that we should focus on here? Uh, and that is because the client often knows their business best and we are very good at what we do. So we need to listen and we need to learn, but we need to have a common ground what is the most important thing. So this is how it looks in our computer uh, when we do our research. This is how it looks when we print that and we have a dialogue within our office and our specialists so it's very much an office which is based on dialogue. And some, I mean, one of the questions that we ask ourselves is how can we strengthen our client's business case? And at the same time, kind of create this added value that we come with. So turning knowledge into results means that the questions that we can ask is, what are your dreams? What are your visions? the goals and the storytelling and the data and the measurements and so on. And the effects that we create is effects on individuals, culture, community, sustainability, maintenance and value. And that creates our design. And it's an, of course a very iterative process which undergoes a lot of different changes in a very kind of disciplined fashion. When you have discipline, then also you have a lot of time to do other stuff or the stuff that you actually want to focus on. So our approach is very based on knowledge and to deliver artistic quality and professional delivery. So how can architects make an impact? And we are starting to kind of close in on community. I believe very much that human interaction is very central in the work that we do and kind of spaces for collective experiences. This is a parking house in Piteå, which is in the very north of Sweden. I'm Swedish and basically in Piteå there is very little uh, uh, actually mountains. Uh, but basically it's right in the center of the city 
and to place such a big parking house there would be quite devastating. So we uh, kind of applied not only wood as a material, which is, you know, it's, it's easy to get closer to, but we also applied this kind of stair and this slope so it could be used in the winter because it's a lot of snow, a long time of the year. And then at one point, which is extremely uh, well known in Sweden, they have this festival with a lot of bands playing and so on. So then it's used as, uh, as part of the stage. Another project which uh, is a lot about human interaction is uh, the Mu Moscow Museum in Denmark. Uh, it's ba basically uh, the ground which is elevated and it's a museum for uh, basically the, 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 the beginning of life you can see, say, and a lot of artifacts about that, about the human beings and so on, so, which are found in, in the ground. But what happened was that people started to use this area way much more than we participated, both during summer and during winter because somehow this roof, it facilitates an added value for different use of different activities. And I think human interaction is also the research and the co-creation and the new technologies that we do in projects. And one thing what's quite interesting for the Uppsala City Hall in Sweden is that we combine technologies from mar marine and offshore uh, CFD simulation, which stands for computer computational fluid dynamics. And that's used for hydrodynamics and wave impact, which they kind of do measurements for these guys out in sea. And then we combine that with VR and gaming industry. And when we start to look at the space that is a huge space for this uh, city hall, we needed to be very aware of how does the acoustic work in order for people to actually be there. So it's not too high or, or, or kind of uh, 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 being aware of what material we use. So this is a plan which basically we, it just shows the principle how this uh, uh, CFD simulation works. It sends out these signals so we can kind of measure and understand how sound works. So this is a... Uh, do we have sound? So here you can see when we are working with the client and we are changing the material on this guy. Can you put it up, the volume? <laughs> There once was a young rat. So material Arthur. changes, acoustic changes. What material is it? Like is it suitable for this area? He would only answer, I don't know. He wouldn't say yes, and he wouldn't say no either. He could never learn to make a choice. His aunt Ellen said. So we can test that in real time, uh, together with the client. So we are engineers, PhDs, and architects working together in a global design community. And I think that we are very interested in designing for communities, not organizations. We are very interested in openness instead of opening hours. And we are very interested in facilitate the unexpected. But I also think that we are quite interested in being hyper-local, which is something that we, as an international design practice, is very, very attentive about. How can we kind of get this in our projects wherever we work in, in the world? Because that is what also is creating uh, added value, but it's also creating ownership to the people that are from the place where we are designing. So one example of that is the Oyster City Hall in Nord uh, uh, Ragöta in the Faroe Islands. You can see it over here. It's a very small project. It's just 750 square meters. It was completed last year. And <clears throat> basically, it's uh, connecting two muni municipalities. And it's a city hall for these uh, municipalities. And they are on each side of the river that goes in here. It's based on uh, a common and very kind of important building tradition in, in uh, the Faroe Islands where you have uh, earth on, 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 the, on the roofs. Uh, we also picked up the, the, the black uh, uh, colors and so on. 
And the Green Roof Town Hall is just not just a building that serves as a bridge between these communities, but it's, you can say, like, it's one that reflects the lives of the community. Uh, and I think that the building also pays a tribute to the distinctive Nordic landscape, in a way, um, and traditional local grass roof houses that are in the area. Um, inside, the decision makers, they are always aware of what's going on, on uh, around them. So they are kind of, you know, they are reminded uh, of where they are, not only you know, looking out, but there is also where they sit and decide, they can actually see the thing that has divided them, the river. And this is their common ground. I think it's the only, uh, it's the only uh, uh, de decision table that uh, has a view towards, the, towards the, the, the river below them. The only town hall. So here you can see how it connects and how you're walking on top and coming down on the other side. So basically that was a bit of an introduction, how we work and some small kind of nips of some projects that are relating to that. Uh, so the first project I'm going to show you is, is uh, a new civic center for Etobicoke uh, in Toronto in Canada, uh, which is here. So there is a quite harsh wind chill factor in uh, Toronto, uh, which is actually making it uh, extremely cold uh, a long time of the year. This was our site, or is our site. Uh, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of ugly high rises, industrial area. So how would you actually be able to kind of create a civic center here? So. Basically, we went out and we started to doing uh, measurements. This is Jakob, he, uh, he's head of our sustainability department. And what we found out was that uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, comfort analysis that we usually do for projects is that 6% uh, of the year that it's perceived the temperature is, feels too hot. Uh, 35 uh, is perceived the temperature is uh, comfortable, but 60% is feels too cold. So, I mean, a civic center uh, where it basically you can't go out and it's like too cold or an area, uh, it's, uh, it's a great challenge. Um, so, uh, what does that actually mean? So, on the site, you need to then start to, this is our initial situation, basically respecting the microclimate and working with that is then kind of creating this... Uh, opportunity to have a public plaza in front of a volume. Now, that would be our ambition. And our ambition, when we kind of carefully have looked at the microclimate in times of both wind, where the prevailing wind comes from, from here, and at the same time how the sun is moving across the site, the result is, with this volume here, is that on a normal day, a typical spring day, you have <coughs> five degrees here and you have plus five degrees on the corner of the plaza and plus 20 degrees, it feels like, uh, in front of the building. So there is a sheltered plaza here which enables us to have up, uh, 50 extra days of outdoor comfort. So you could say that the strategic concept somehow uh, is prolonging the feeling of summer. And that is, of course, an extremely crucial factor for not only a civic center situated at that place with such bad conditions around, but also to kind of try to achieve a net zero strategy, which is to reduce the energy consumption, optimizing the building performance, and produce and harness energy. But it's not all about science. It's also to try to find the connection to the cultural heritage. And Etobicoke is very much like Manhattan. It's kind of built up of these different communities and the, and the mosaic of, of the grid in the, in the city. So we started to play around with that and basically then kind of uh, made these kind of cascaded uh, terraces uh, and created this plaza in front. So that became the architectural vision. And since these town halls are not the town halls that 
it used to be. It's, I mean, when I go into a town hall and so on, it, it's if I'm feeling a bit uneasy. I need to go and kind of ask somebody. And it's like uh, big volume, uh, big, big, big spaces. And it's like, okay, can I actually be here or can't I be here? But the new town halls, more like civic centers, you go in and there is a potpourri of different kind of functions uh, which you can, can engage. And it's like, a, it's like a very much a new meeting space for new citizens and the citizens of, of uh, a particular town. In this case, it was a game changer for the client that we were able to have this civic square sheltered in front of such a variety of program. It of course, and then you have the stupid offices in the back. It of course kind of changed this kind of dialogue with the community, whereas you could have, you know, meet your council member, you have public events, morning yoga or other activities, concerts, pop-up playground, festivals of different kinds, and so on and so forth. So, when you enter this building, there is an open space with a lot of diff different fo uh, functions actually connecting to that. So the, the bath is also connected to where people move so they can kind of come from the, for the first time and maybe discover that, oh, I can go for a swim here as well. Uh, and when you're outside and maybe there is a farmer's market in the plaza, it feels quite kind of, you know, uh, intimate and low scale with a greenery in front and these kind of quite low buildings on the right, but you're actually part of something which is quite large. And now the municipality have actually asked us to have a look at the master plan around, which is quite interesting. So another project which basically kind of has a bit of the same uh, challenges, but in a totally different way, is the Siemens Global Headquarter, which is right in the center of Munich. This is the old part of Munich, and this is basically the, the, the museum district in Un Munich. And we didn't really know like Munich a lot when we started the competition, but what we were quite fascinated about was that there was a, a lot of different kind of courtyards in Munich things that you could kind of slip through and, you know, there were different kind of identities in these courtyards and so on and so forth. So when you want to kind of build a headquarter for Siemens, you know, like somehow the core of, of the industry in, 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 uh, in Germany, uh, you need to make it from, for the people. Um, and I think like how to make this uh, an integrated part of Munich? Basically, we looked at the plan and started to kind of invite and push uh, the idea uh, of kind of getting people to be part of it. And we did a rational optimization for a, for a great kind of office uh, a width in terms of the plan. And then got the public flow to actually come through the building with different courtyards and so on. So it's actually an open building for the public where you can walk through here. You can even go into the reception area. And basically, it has been part of rebranding uh, Siemens and how they look at themselves in terms of how they work and so on. And I think this also kind of touches on something which is maybe more hyper-global, and it's the social media aspect where it's a different community, which is uh, 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 under internet and so on, where you can see like how people of Munich are interacting with Siemens in a totally different way than they've done before. So um, another product which leaves because, I mean, Instagram in all its glory, it also connects to maybe a younger, public, uh, younger audience somehow. And a younger audience is, of course, the people that are going also a lot in universities. And this is university which is in uh, Colling, in the center of Colling. <clears throat> and uh, we have the site here, and it's part of uh, a campus where there are a lot of different campus facilities, and then you have the city core up here. So what we wanted to do was that, okay, we need to be quite part of, of this river here, and there are some large trees, and they have sound, and it's, it's quite a nice, area, but we need to shelter from this big road and we need to open up for the people that are coming from here. 
So basically, when we had these kind of things in mind, it created this kind of triangle that this should be like a public plaza. And what was left was this kind of perfect triangle that we then designed for the new university in, in uh, Colling. And that also became the central kind of building for this campus, with the central plaza, new plaza for the, for the city. And it's not only the building in itself, when you come inside, it was also very important to get it to kind of uh, integrate and connect to the surrounding cities, whereas we designed the atrium to actually be open when you come in, of course, but then it rotates around inside the building, creating these kind of very large double high spaces that creates views to the outside and the surrounding city. And the plan itself is very kind of activity-based spaces. So you have focus areas out in the periphery. And then right in the center, you have everybody moving up for the coffee and the cafe that is on the top. Uh, and then when you walk up or you walk down, you have these ledges that you can kind of see people where they are working and so on. And then you have the intermediate spaces in between creating this kind of accessibility throughout the building. And you can see where people are and so on. And this is when you come in. And all the ledges here are also kind of, uh, there, there, are, there are tables there, so you always see people sitting there. So I'm moving a bit fast because uh, I have some slides left. But I think what these images they actually show is the variety of different spaces for different people that are always kind of connecting out and looping out to either these outdoor areas or the space inside, which is then kind of cascading up to the, the, the skylights. Uh, and funny enough, when we won the competition, when the mayor had his speech, he said that, well, this triangular building uh, is perfect for our triangular area in Denmark, which are these three municipalities. And we actually didn't talk about that at all during the competition, but sometimes things happen. So, this next project is uh, it's, uh, it's a, also a town hall uh, in the very north of Sweden in, in Kiruna. And it's part of uh, Kiruna. Actually, they, uh, they are about to move uh, big parts of the city because it's a mining town. So uh, they need to move big parts of the city because otherwise they are afraid that it actually implodes and uh, the whole city is gonna, going underground. So this is actually the first building that they are then moving, which is the town hall, of course. Um, and it's a subarctic climate. I mean, snow cover from September to May, and it's 24 hours of daylight in June and July, and 24 hours of darkness in December. This is the old town hall, which uh, we were quite inspired by. So, uh, regarding materials and so on and so forth, uh, we actually got this uh, old uh, 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 um, uh, clock tower. Actually, got moved together with the uh, with the old uh, with, with the new with the new town hall. Here is uh, where it stands today, and it needed to be moved. Uh, actually, uh, uh, three and a half kilometers. The location of it. So. When you do that, when you've been standing there for so long,